Hi, welcome to Algebra 2 Common Core. Tonight in lesson number two, we're going to take a look at how sets can be represented using Venn diagrams. So there are times that we want to determine the probability that either event A happened or event B happened. So to do this, we need to be able to account for all of the outcomes that fall into either one of the two events. So we're going to take a look at using a Venn diagram to represent the numbers that fall into the events. For example number one, take a look at the spinner that you're given. The spinner is divided into eight equally sized sectors of a circle. So because they're equally sized, that means that the likelihood of getting any number is exactly the same. So in this experiment, we're going to let A be the event of landing on an even and B the event of landing on a prime number. So you'll notice here that we've labeled A as evens, B as primes. Now in our Venn diagram, you should recognize the different pieces. A is going to be this entire circle representing all my evens. B is going to be this entire circle representing all the primes. What they have in common it goes right here in the uh, intersection is what we call this, the place where the two cross each other. You'll also notice that the circles are enclosed in a large rectangle, and that rectangle is going to include our entire sample space. So, first of all, let's talk about what it means to be a prime number. So a prime number is any number, it has to be greater than 1, that has no divisors other than 1 and itself. So that means that 1 cannot go in the set of prime numbers, nor can it go in the set of even numbers, so that means that I'm going to put 1 outside of both circles. I'm going to put 1 anywhere inside the rectangle, but not included in either circle. Now when I look at the rest of the numbers, I say, okay, a prime number could be the number, and I think I might even list this down here before I put it into my circles. The prime numbers are the ones that don't have any factors other than themselves and 1. So that would be, of course, the number 2, the number 3, the number 5, and the number 7. However, when we look at the other circle, the evens, we know, of course, that the evens are going to be 2, 4, 6, and 8. So you'll notice that they only have one number in common, and that number that they have in common is the number 2. So when I'm going to put this on my Venn diagram, the 2 is going to be part of both circles, so I put it in that section right there, again called the intersection. For the rest of the evens, they're not prime, so that means I'm going to put the numbers 4, 6, and 8 anywhere in this circle as long as it's not in the intersection. For the other prime numbers, I've already written down 2 in the intersection, but the other prime numbers are going to be 3, 5, and 7. Now first of all, you'll notice that I had to represent every single outcome from the spinner, so I should have eight outcomes represented on my picture. I do, if you see that the number 1 is outside the two circles, count it up and see that we do have the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So we have drawn the Venn diagram showing these sets. Now in the box that's labeled Venn diagrams, I have tried to differentiate between the four different sections on our Venn diagram. So you'll notice first of all the section labeled A. So the part that is just A, not included in B. That would be the, the members of the set of A, but not in the members of B. Likely, likewise, um, I have this side of my diagram, so that would be this side over here, would be the elements that are in B, but not in A. The intersection will be the elements that are in both sets A and B. And the ones on the outside of the circle here, so all around the edge but still inside the rectangle, those would be the elements that are neither in A nor in B. So they're part of the sample space, but they don't fit into either category of A or B. 
let's see if we can practice reading a Venn diagram. So I'm given this Venn diagram where S stands for the students who participate in sports and B stands for the students that participate in band. So if I want to know how many students participate in organized sports, that means I've got to look at the S circle and include everything in the S circle. So as a total here, I'm going to say the S circle is going to be 442 plus 21. And when I add that together, that's giving me 463 students participate in sports. So I had to include the students that only participated in sports, but also the students that participated in sports and band. How many students play in the band? Likewise, now we're going to look at the B circle, and we're going to say, how many people are in the B circle? Well, there's 31 that only participate in band, but then there's another 21 that are in the band as well as play sports. So adding those together, I've got 52 students that are in band. How many students do not participate in organized sports? Well, that means I want to take my entire set, but not include the sports group. So that means that I do want to include this side over here, the ones that are in band but not in sports. And I want to include this many over here, the ones that are neither in band nor sports. So in this case, I'm going to say let's take the 31 that are in band but not sports and add the 339 that are neither in band nor sports. And I end up with a total of 370 students that are not in organized sports. To finish part D off, it says how many students participate in organized sports or play in the band? Well, if I want an or there, that means that I've got to have the ones that are just in sports, the ones that are just in band, but I also want to include the ones that are part of both. So in this case, I'm going to say the 442 that play sports but not band, the 21 that play sports and band, and the 31 that play in the band but not sports. When I add all those together, I see that I'm getting a total of 495 students. Now I'm going to take one more step here. There's not, this question isn't asked, but I want to incorporate this as well. Um, how about if I was trying to figure out what is the total number of students in the school? So the total number of students represented in this Venn diagram. To do that, in Part D, we talked about the students that participated in sports or played in the band. That gave us 494 students. But then we see that there are another 339 outside of that circle. So I'm going to go ahead and add those two numbers together because that would be the total of all of the students that we are talking about. So I'm ending up with, I think it's going to be, uh, seven, I think it's 833. I don't have a calculator in front of me this time. Uh, but I get to 500 and then I've got another 333. So a total of 833 students would be represented in this diagram. In example number three, we're just going to shade our Venn diagram representing the um, instances or the circumstances that were given in each part. So it says at a high school, some students play soccer, some do not. Some students play basketball, some do not. So this time S stands for the soccer players, B stands for the basketball players. So we've got that the circle labeled S represents the students who play soccer. And the circle labeled B represents the students who play basketball. The rectangle represents all the students at the school. So in the first Venn diagram, we want to shade the region representing the students who play soccer. Those who play soccer have to be the ones that are in the S circle. So I'm going to color in the whole S circle. Of course, that would also include the ones that are in the intersection of S and B. So it's the whole S circle. 
For part B, it says the students who do not play soccer. So do not play soccer means the ones that are outside of the soccer circle. So that means I'm going to color all this group over here, the ones that play basketball but do not play soccer. But I actually also have to include the rest of the students in the school that don't play soccer. So those are all the students outside of the two circles. They will be the students who do not play soccer. So again, I'm not going to fill in anything in the S circle because the S circle are the soccer players. In part C, it says, let's find the students who play soccer and play basketball. So those are going to be the students who are part of both of our circles. So that has to be our intersection, so that section right there. And for part D, the students who play soccer or play basketball, that means that's going to be the students that are in the soccer circle, but also the students that are in the basketball circle. So the or will be all of the students encompassed inside both of those circles. So we have a definition for two different words in the box below. The first, first of all, we're talking about two sets, A and B. The union we associate with the word or. So when I take a look at the left-hand side here, the union is going to be all of the members that are part of A or part of B. So that means it's going to be the entire filled-in circle on the left, but also the filled-in circle on the right, and we are also using the members inside um, the intersection of the two. And that brings up our second word, intersection. Intersection is generally associated with the word and. So as an intersection, I'm going to say A and B. Oh, I didn't focus on the, the notation on the first one, but and is an upside down U, whereas or is a U standing for union. So on the second diagram, the part of the Venn diagram that is going to be the intersection is going to be the part that's part of both circles. Lastly, in example number four, we want to take a look at how to fill in a Venn diagram with the right number of um, students in the, in the spots. So again, we're going to say that S stands for the students playing soccer, and B stands for the students who play basketball. So I'm given some information. I'm given that there are 230 students who play soccer, and there are 190 students who play basketball. So right now you should be thinking, oh, I wonder if there's any that play both sports. And in fact, yes, I found out that there are 60 students that play both sports. And that's actually where we want to always begin. So I'm going to even put a note here and say, begin here. Begin with the number of students that are part of both sets. So in this case, I'm going to come down to my picture and I'm going to say, okay, there have to be 60 students inside both of the sets, inside the intersection. Now, focusing on the left side, the soccer students, I'm going to change colors and use purple, 230 students play soccer. So that means that within this circle on the left side, I've got to have a total of 230. Well, I've already put 60 in the intersection, so those 60 have to be part of this 230. So if I say 230 minus 60, that tells me that the students who play soccer but don't play basketball have to be 170. And again, you can check that by adding those two numbers together and say, does that equal the number of students that play soccer? We're going to do something similar on the basketball side. We know from the narrative above that there are 190 students that play basketball. So if there's 190 students in that B circle, I've already put 60 into the intersection, so that means I've got to have 130 that only play basketball and don't play soccer. 
And again, check your work here by saying, does 60 plus 130 equal the total number of students playing basketball? And yes, it does. For my last part here, I'm going to take a look at the total number of students in the whole school. So I know that there are a total of 500 students at the school. So I've already represented some inside my circles. So I'm going to say, okay, to get, um, let's see, all together in the whole thing, I'm going to have 500. I'm not putting that inside the box. I want to put inside the box, but outside the circle, the students who don't play sports, I'm sorry, don't play soccer, and don't play basketball. So if I add together all the students that I've um, got so far, I'm going to see that I've taken into account 170 that play just soccer, 130 that play just basketball, and 60 that play both. So all together I see that I've accounted for 360 students in the school. Those students either play soccer or basketball or both. But if there are 500 students in the school and I've already accounted for the 360 that play those two sports, then that should mean that there are 140 that do not play those sports. So the 140 has to go somewhere outside of the circles, but inside of the rectangle. So let's take a look at the questions now that I've filled out my Venn diagram picture. How many students play basketball but not soccer? So the basketball people are in this circle, but these play soccer. So the ones that don't play soccer would be those right there, 130 of them. Now we can extend this idea of a Venn diagram into probability. So it says suppose that a student will be selected at random from the school. What is the probability? So that's going to be a ratio for us that the selected student plays both sports. So looking at our picture, we see that the students that play both sports are right here in the intersection, 60. Out of how many are in the entire sample space? All 500 students in the school. Now again, we're allowed to leave our answer without reducing. If you did reduce this, I would reduce by 10 first of all, and then reduce by 2, so I would end up with 3 out of 25 as my probability, but it's just as correct to leave it as 60 over 500. Also, it's okay to leave it as a percent as well, so I could also say that 3 out of 25 is going to equal 12%. Let's finish it off with the last one. What is the probability that the student plays soccer but doesn't play basketball? So we need to look for the students that play soccer, but not basketball. So here's my soccer players that are only soccer players. So I'm going to say 170 of them play soccer, and not basketball, out of the whole student body population, 500. And again, if you wanted to reduce, I could say that this is 17 out of 50 students or that would be 34% of the school. So we've done quite a bit of work in representing our probabilities and our numbers and Venn diagrams today. We're going to see in future lessons how these Venn diagrams are very helpful in calculating probabilities. We just had a small taste of it in this little lesson. So have a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow when we're going to be working some more on making Venn diagrams in class. Bye-bye.